Dear friends of the D12 Café, chers amis du D12 Café, a small warning before we start. Une petite mise en garde avant de commencer. Some of our episodes are in French and some are in English. Certains de nos épisodes sont en français, d'autres sont en anglais. If an episode is in a language that you don't understand, si un épisode est dans une langue que vous ne comprenez pas, the solution is to watch it on our YouTube channel and to activate the subtitles. La solution, c'est de regarder le podcast sur notre chaîne YouTube et d'activer les sous-titres. Another cool thing you can do is to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which helps us a lot. Un autre truc cool que vous pouvez faire, c'est vous abonner à notre chaîne YouTube, ça nous aide pas mal. Thank you and let's go to the cafe. Merci et en route pour le café. Welcome on the D12 Cafe, a podcast about role playing and writing, uh, and where I'm having guests who talk both about writing and, and role playing games. And I'm really happy and very honored to have Paul Fricker on the show. I mean, in, in Kathy Bates' words, I would say I'm your number one fan in France, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, bonjour, Henri. <laughs> bonjour. Uh, apologies that my, uh, my French isn't up to uh, a French interview, but I'm very happy to be. On the show. So you're an Englishman in chaos, young Paul. I'm going to introduce you to some of our French viewers, even even though I'm sure most of them know you. Um, the sun actually never rises on chaos, young now. Uh, there's even a Frenchman, my next door neighbor, Loïc Musy, who's a good friend of mine, is, is oh, working for chaos, yeah. young. Great artist. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So in 2001, you became part of uh, a UK group called the Cult of Keepers. Uh, and you were writing and running scenarios at game conventions. Some of those uh, scenarios were actually published by the Chaosium uh, Miskatonic Library Association. That's correct. Uh, one of them called Gatsby and the Great Race could have up to 32 players, I've read. Re That's playing. right. <laughs> That must be yeah. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess multiple GMs, I guess. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just, that would be too difficult. In 2009, you worked on Cthulhu Britannica with Mike Mason, which was published by Cubicle 7. And in 2013, you worked, and well, I mean, you probably started before 2013, but I mean, you published the um, seventh edition of the Call of Cthulhu rulebook, where you worked on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that same year, you start, I think, if I'm not wrong, you started the Blasphemous Tomes in that, set, in that same year? Yep. Uh, yeah. So it's 10 years ago, actually. It's, it's, it's your anniversary. Yes, in June, I think we celebrate 10 years of the Good Friends of Jackson Elias podcast. Oh, excellent. Which is a podcast about Call of Cthulhu, horror films and horror gamings in general, as you say at the beginning of this episode, is correct. <laughs> every two yeah. weeks. Uh, in 2015, you worked on the London Supplement with Scott Dorwood, which is one of your co-hosts on, on the, the Good Friends of Jackson Elias. And I hope he's going to be on the show one of these days. Uh, Nameless Horrors, uh, then it was Pulp Cthulhu, both with Scott yeah. and Matt again, so the same gang working on, on those books. And Down Darker Trails, uh, the year after that, in 2017, which is a Cthulhu Western supplement, a bit in the, in the spirit of Deadland, which is a, a role-playing game that I like a lot. Um, then you published, in 2017, The Two-Headed Serpent, a wonderful pulp, pulp Cthulhu campaign, uh, where you worked both with Scott and Matt again. Uh, and in 2020, you uh, worked on uh, the new edition of the Masks of Nyarlathotep. Uh, I think it was precisely the, the first chapter, the new first chapter in Peru, was that it? Uh, that was Scott work primarily on that one. Okay. Uh, I worked on um, the Kenya chapter and the Australia chapter. Okay. I'm actually playing it right now. Uh, not, oh, right, not right. GMing, so don't don't spoil anything. Okay, no spoilers. <laughs> we're in, we're in uh, Egypt right now. Um, in last year, you worked on Rivers of London, which is not a scenario but a whole role-playing game, mm. uh, both with Mike Mason and Lynn Hardy. And on a more personal level, 
You've published a few scenarios uh, with the Miskatonic repository, like Full Fathom 5 that you wrote on your own, uh, or all the ones like My Little Sister, which is a, a mm. kind of sci-fi Call of mm. Cthulhu scenario, and for and uh, Dark Side Dogs as well, which is a modern day um, yeah. Call of Cthulhu scenario. Yeah. Yeah. But most of all, the most important thing in your career is that you're a Marillion fan. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm a big Marillion fan. Yeah, that's, yes, that, yes. I mean, that's the, the best quality you can have. Uh, it does, is. That, does that sum it up correctly, or have I missed anything important? I, I think that's a better summary than I could have managed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so we'll start with the interview now. If you remember it, can you tell us, Paul, uh, your very first RPG session? Do you remember your very first time you played and how Dis it felt? Distinctly. Um, it was in the school canteen. A friend of mine said, do you want to play a game? And I always loved playing games. And I was the youngest child in the family. And my, my, my next brother is like eight years older than me. So by the time I was kind of old enough to play games, people didn't really want to play games with me in the family. And also back then, games meant maybe chess or Monopoly or, or things like that. But I was always keen to play games. So when this friend of mine we hadn't gamed together before and he said do you want to play a game there's some uh, sixth formers who were like uh, what would they be like maybe four or five years older than us i was 13 i think mm -hmm. so they were like 17 say so at that age they're adults they're much older and we sat in on their game in the school canteen i think me and phil we didn't actually play we just observed yeah and they were playing Dun advanced dungeon dragons um, around the table in the school canteen and I was immediately captivated um, and I think I observed, we observed one week and then they gave us some photocopies of bits of the rules like just fragments and from then on we were just hooked and we were there every Friday evening in the canteen with our own little group <laughs> of contemporaries just playing playing that every week it was great yeah, yeah. I think there's quite a lot of us in that generation started playing with photocopies <laughs> yeah I, I even started playing with only uh, six-sided dice actually because they oh wow <laughs> right <laughs> okay I uh, which do you enjoy most now GMing or playing I, I wouldn't be able to pick I enjoy both um yeah I, I really do it's kind of down the line for me i enjoy both um i guess if i if if you really made me pick probably you know being gm um but i i, I don't like just doing one or the other solely okay and i and i know that you gm a lot in conventions uh yeah. Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer jamming in convention, or do you prefer jamming with a, a team that you that you've known for a long time and for long campaigns? Or I I like jamming at event, uh, conventions. I think you get to meet new people, yeah, uh, which is always nice. And I think that that factor of meeting new people and sitting down at a table, and as soon as you say right you know there's no great preamble we just get into the game and it just gives the game such an intensity because everybody is focused on the game nobody really knows each other maybe but everybody's there for a common purpose and you've only got maybe three three and a half four hours to to get through the game and everybody wants to put on their best show you know everybody wants to 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 bring their best game um and it, i think it really focuses my mind when i'm i'm running those games uh, playing for a game at home is is great in as well but i think it's hard to capture that same level of intensity right yeah there's also one thing that we were talking about with your pr the previous guest on the show which was when you play in conventions uh the players are not as much involved in their characters as they would be on a long campaign so they dare to you know they, they they're more adventurous sometimes because they it's not that that bad if they die for example yeah <laughs> so that's probably yeah which I, th I i think that lends itself very well to you know i like the cthulhu one shots i mean campaigns are great but obviously you're not running those at a convention. So if you're running at home, I think campaigns are great because it does allow people to get into their characters and you get a longer story arc and it's a different dynamic. Um, but I like the convention games, which are, you know, give that one-off 
story very much like a horror film or a short horror story and like you say people are willing to throw themselves into it and die horribly and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know if that's you know if that's part of the story then that can be fun are you a by the book gm how, how much does system matter to you i mean you've been <laughs> working you've been working on the system of call of cthulhu so i guess system matters but for you how much freedom do you take when with the rules when you're gming and do you you homebrew rules a lot or well i guess because myself and mike wrote the book <laughs> yeah. um i i feel a pressure on me to <laughs> yeah. try to you know showcase the rules in the book yeah. and sometimes you know we went through various iterations of some of the rules well most of the rules you know changed so sometimes i find that we come to a, a rule and i'm like oh was it is it this or that because you know they were both rules at one point yeah. and i'm having to remember exactly what the rule is um so uh no I, i i guess in answer to your question generally i try to stick to the rules of the the game as written yeah and and i hope that you know i tried to design them in such a way that they would that accommodate whatever it is you throw at them okay and if i took a a, a peek behind your gm screen what would i see uh You would you would see a GM screen because I quite like using a GM screen. Mm -hmm. uh, you would see a folder um, open with a, a bunch of pages. It might be a printout of the scenario with bits highlighted, um, or it might just be a sheet of a couple of sheets of paper with with um, sort of bullet points written down. Uh, you'd see some dice. You'd see probably my phone with the time on, so I can keep an eye on the on the time. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and inside the keeper's screen, you know, I've got the, you know, the the, the uh, synopsis of the rules there. If if I should need them, I find sometimes the bouts of sanity table. I might refer to that, you know, for inspiration, uh, but I don't tend to use it much other than that. I think that's what you'd see. Yeah. Okay, so you, you you said that system did matter to you, and how important is role playing for you as a GM? How much effort do you put in uh, impersonating your your NPCs, for example? And how are you asking your players to role play as much as they can? Is that is that an import, important part of role playing for you? It is. I find that there's a friend of mine, Robin, who I play with whenever I can because he's a great GM and one of the things that he always does when you start sort of you know you say well maybe somebody will say well can we do such and such and that they're, they're you know they're addressing an NPC and they'll they'll address them as the player and and but he will step into character mm -hmm. and he will start role playing that that NPC and then I observed that the player then feels compelled to do so as well so I think as players we tend to look to the GM for what to do in this game um, and if the GM is is putting on you know voices and trying and, and role playing the characters role playing the NPCs then I think the players reflect that and do it back if the GM doesn't do it Some players are going to speak in character and role play their characters, but some players aren't going to. Um, so I think it's uh, yeah. I think I think if you do it as as GM, I think the players are more likely to do it in reaction, and I just think that does build for me. Uh, that's the kind of game I want to play. Okay, would you say that rolling the dice is also one of the very important parts of the pleasure of playing, or? Would you be able to play a role-playing game without ever having to roll any die? Okay, yes to both bits. So, yes, you can play a role-playing game without rolling any dice. I have done that. I can remember years ago, I think probably coming from D&D &D and then moving to Call of Cthulhu and then moving to very role-play heavy sessions, we'd get to the end of it and we'd say, well, there was no combat in that game. Mm -hmm. did, actually, did anybody roll any dice? I, I don't think they did. And we had a great time but you know it's called a role-playing game so i don't think the objective is just to role play i think the objective is to role play and play a game and games you know in this context use dice um 
normally use, use dice, certainly in Call of Cthulhu they're using dice. So I think there's a balance to be struck. I think both parts are, are great. I think there's the role playing aspect and there's the, the gaming aspect, you know, in terms of like rolling dice and mechanics and so on. And I don't think one detracts from the other. I think the two complement each other. And hopefully the the mechanics, you know, when you're rolling the dice, it can just be, you know, do I hit you with my fist? Yeah. But but when you're pushing rolls or something like that, I think it, it, it can up the pressure. So I've had situations where the characters say they're going to do something and they fail the roll. And then they say, well, can we push the roll? And I say, yeah, sure. What are you going to do? And they say, well, you know, we're going to do this thing. And I, and they, and then they, then they say, well, what might go wrong? And I tell them what <laughs> might go wrong. And they're like, oh, I'm not sure if you want to do that now. Yeah. So it, it, you know, that, that reflects back into how they then role play their characters, maybe being more cautious or deciding to do something else. So, um, yeah, I think the, it's important that mechanics inform the role playing and, and, it- and the two. Yeah. And it brings a little bit of hazard as well, of luck in, in, mm. in, in of course, like in life. I mean, yeah. Um, so look, look me in the eyes and tell me: Have you ever cheated on results of dice behind your GM screen? And if yes, why? <laughs> and it's you have you know you're under oath. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have in the past. I'm sure I've been. I'm going to say guilty of it. It's okay. rather judgmental of me. Um, <laughs> I I tend to very much avoid doing so. I don't think I don't think I have. I don't think it's something I've done for a long time. And to be honest, when I roll the dice, you ask what was behind my GM screen. There would be dice, but when I roll them, I'm you know I stand up and I I roll them in in the player's view. Okay. And I say, okay, I'm going to roll for this. If I fail it you're going to fall and take damage or, you know, and I say what I think is important to say what's going to happen if I succeed in this role or fail in this role. Cause otherwise you're just rolling dice and then you're thinking, Oh, what happens now that I've failed it? So, cause sometimes people say that about dice. They say, well, what happens if you fail it? You know that, you know, I needed to change it cause well, don't roll the dice in that case or decide what's going to happen you know t- typically like they're landing an airplane and maybe they're making a roll to, to land the airplane well it doesn't mean that if they fail it it doesn't mean that everybody crashes and burns and dies right so you can set up the expectation of what's going to happen with that roll maybe you're going to damage the plane if you if you if you fail the roll here it's going to damage the plane and it's not going to be able to take off again something like that that's kind of doesn't stop the game but but changes the narrative Okay. The GM is uh, sometimes called referee, uh, and under this name, he's granted a, a more important role than than a simple narrator. I mean, he's given some 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 kind of social and moral responsibility of the game. He's a moderator. Uh, he can be a judge, um, <coughs> and sometimes <coughs> must ease the tensions that may arise from time to time around the table. So are you aware of this social and moral responsibility? And do you establish rules with your players before you play? Do you warn them in advance of the lines not to cross? Is that something important to you? Yes. Um, and I think that's become more so the awareness of, of that has become increased over the last few years. So in terms of like player safety tools, so I, I use the X card Um, yeah. when I'm playing a game um, and I think I think that's very I think that's a very simple and very useful tool so uh, if for those who aren't familiar with that you know if there's something that somebody objects to for whatever reason they can touch the X card and we we roll back or we address that and you use that in convention exclusively or also home Probably conventions. Yeah, just just convention, I think. Um, when I'm at home, I'm playing with people I know. I mean, I would still recommend people use it, but it's, you know, it's down to you and your group, I think. Um, and I think somebody pointed out to me, which I, which I kind of liked, was the fact that if you've got, if you're playing with that, then it, it gives people an opportunity to 
to object to something or to raise a concern. And some people think, oh, well, that's a bad thing. But actually, it means you can then push the boundaries, but you feel like if people are bothered, they're gonna, they, they've got a, a way of telling you. Mm -hmm. So you can almost push the boundaries perhaps more than you might have done otherwise. I don't know. That's a interesting. It just, just sort of interested me, that idea. Um, in terms of being a referee, yes, I think I am, I am aware of that. I think I'm maybe a bit old school in that I think that the GM um, has got a different role to the other players. Some people will sort of say everybody's a player at the table and everybody's equal. And I would agree that everybody is equal, everybody is a player. But I think there's still, in, in games like Call of Cthulhu and Dungeons and Dragons, I think there is still an onus on the, the GM to um, to prepare the game and to facilitate the game in a way that is quite different to the players. Um, so their role is quite different. Um, you know, you can, if you meet up and a player is, is missing, the game go, can go ahead. If you meet up and the GM isn't there, well, somebody's yeah. <laughs> going to have to step up or there's no game. Yeah. So now we're going to move to the writing part of the uh, interview. And, uh, of course, how, how did it all start for you? When when, and why did you decide that you not only wanted to play uh, or GM, but also that you wanted to write your own stories for, for role-playing games? I think it's one of the beauties of role-playing games is that almost, well, a lot of people, I was going to say almost everyone, I can't speak for everyone, but a lot of people end up writing yeah, just for themselves maybe right most people is writing for themselves they're preparing they're creating it encourages it stimulates your imagination which i think is the primary goal of role-playing games and it encourages you to, to to create if you're a player you're creating a character maybe you're creating maybe just a couple of lines of background maybe just a couple of ideas but you're 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 coming up with things every time you speak you're creating your own lines so it encourages the generation of fiction. Um, and I looked, I went through, so I'd, I'd got boxes of stuff from, that I'd just stuck in a box and kept for decades. And then I went through it, and it's not loads, it's like an odd box of, of old clutter that I'd got. And I opened up this old, it was actually a White Dwarf envelope that, you know, a, a White Dwarf magazine came mm -hmm. in years ago. And I pulled it out, and it was a submission that I'd written, like, in the early 80s to White Dwarf for a scenario competition. And I typed it up on, a, on an actual typewriter and done little pictures and everything. <laughs> and I realized, oh, I was, I was like trying to write things when I was, I don't know, 15 or something like that. So it's always been something that I wanted to do, but I don't think I was able to realize that until like I was in my, I don't know, what was I? Uh, about 40 I guess late 30s um, and and that well, that was a gradual process through writing games for myself and then writing them for you know the Cult of Keepers that you mentioned with Mike Mason uh, and then you know getting drawn to, to getting asked to have one published by Chaosium and so it was this kind of gradual incremental process Okay, um, so maybe uh, I've I've missed it, but I didn't find any fiction published by Paul Fricker anywhere. I mean, you know, like a novel or a short story. Have you ever published fiction? Like uh, not yet. A, a short story in a fanzine or not yet. Not yet. Am I supposed to understand that you're you're working on one at the moment? I am working on some very very short stories. Um, so I don't think I know you, you're a um, an accomplished novelist. Um, I I don't feel driven to to write a novel. Um, I know a lot of people do. Um, it's not something that I see myself doing. Um, but I do like, and I and I have, you know, decades ago. And over the, the the years, written the odd short story, and and I like writing those. And um, even just like say five hundred to a thousand words, just a, a really short, short little um, 
bits of what you might call I don't know flash fiction or whatever. So, so I'm I'm drawn to doing those. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain why? Do you know why? Do you know what 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 appeals to you in in that? Now, I mean, now that you're a professional RPG uh, scenario writer, what appeals to me in in writing fiction? fiction? Yeah, I think I enjoy the process of sitting down and starting writing and just seeing where it goes. Um, so I don't tend to, I know, you know, there's this idea that some writers are architects and some are, what's the other term, gardeners or something like that. Some, some see what grows and some like design it all in advance. Right. Um, so I tend to just take an idea or just write, whatever comes into my head for a first line and then just enjoy that process of just seeing where it goes and what feels right and it feels a little bit like role playing um in that when i'm role playing you know you, you don't know what's coming next and you as a player uh, and you and you say things and you narrate things and you build story um and sometimes i get that feeling when i'm writing scenarios as well it's almost like you're discovering the story you're not discovering it you're making it up right in your head mm -hmm. but you somehow make little links and you've got something happening here and something happening there and then you realize oh maybe this guy did that thing or, or whatever and it and and it's exciting as the creator to sort of make those links in your own work um and i find that in a, in a small way sometimes in fiction that i enjoy the little surprises that that come out of it Yeah, it's it's interesting because the, the the sometimes the surprises that your players um, you know make by making some decisions that you are not that you didn't think of before beforehand uh, as a GM you have to. You have to think about that when you write a scenario as well. You have to to, mm. to prepare the GM, uh, you know, to give as much as you can to the GM uh, in case his players are surprising. <laughs> so yeah. how do you how do you manage that? Well, I think it is a case of that. It's the case of thinking what might the players do. You can't. Uh, foresee everything that the players might do, but you can see the likely things players might do, and. So then you address those those likely things, and you and I think it's important to try and put the reader, the you know the the GM that's reading the scenario, try to put them in your shoes because as the writer, as the creator of a scenario, you've got the full vision of it. You can see the whole picture, but as someone reading it, they they don't want to you know to 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 read something and get a full grasp of it and understand it completely. That, that, that's quite a lot of work so you want to be able to I think the, the thing is for a scenario it needs to come off the page as efficiently and as quickly as as you can make it um, to make the you know the, the keeper's life as easy as possible um, so I think as an example of something that surprised me that, that actually worked there's uh, the alone against the flames yeah. in the starter box set and I, I participated in a, in a reading group uh, with the Storytelling Collective who do the Write Your Own First Adventure program and so on, an online group. And they recently started a Bookworms group, which is like a reading group. And over a month, they read through the starter box set and I joined them a few times to to, to you know in discussion. And one of the players there said, oh, I've, I've um, played Alone Against the Flames, really enjoyed it. It's one of those kind of solo adventures, you know, turn to page 53 if you do this, page 55 if you do this. So it's, it's that kind of old school, find your own adventure format. Mm -hmm. But one of the players said, oh, I ran that for a friend. And I said, oh, what do you mean? He said, oh, I ran it. As a like it was a scenario one on one, me as the keeper and and my friend, and I narrated the the text, but I didn't tell them it was a find your own adventure scenario. But he said everything I needed, all the choices they made, were covered in the text, and that really said to me, oh, that that alone against the flames book then does exactly that. It addresses everything that the keeper is likely to need, um, and, and, and you know, and the player wasn't aware of that. So the player was making decisions. Obviously, if the player had done something radically different, that probably wouldn't have been covered by the book. Mm -hmm. But the thing is to cover the likely outcomes. And I think that's a, maybe just a skill that you 
get or hopefully acquire as your as your writing scenarios mm-hmm. and as your GMing as well because I mean being being a, a, a big fan of the Jack, of the good friends of Jackson Elias I I'm starting to know a little bit the differences between you Scott and Matt <laughs> yeah it feels like you're three people you know three guys that I know now uh, and I'm and, and I have the the feeling that Scott is very much into improvisation when mm-hmm. he's playing and when he's GMing. Uh, what about you? Do you intervene uh, on your players' decisions sometimes if you see they go off track to match, or do you just let it go and, and see what happens? I think it depends how radically they go off track and the constraints of the game. So if if I'm running a convention game and everything is sort of plotted for them to be at this location and they they're going to go off somewhere totally different or they or then they decide they're not even going to go to that location in some instances i might sort of step out out of the almost like step back from the game and speak to the players and say look guys you can do that but you know you, you're not there's going to be that that's you're going to miss the rest of the game really or you know if everybody's going here but your player's going there i might sort of say well your player goes there for a, and and they find there's nothing there do you want to go and join the rest of the group because <laughs> that's where the rest of the game is going to be so i i tend to maybe do that yeah, it's a very rare occurrence i mean that that doesn't happen very often but i'm 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 happy to do that if i feel that it's going to make the game better for people i think yeah i think we we're all ready to to improvise though to go with what the players um do and i and i don't like to let the players know that i'm improvising i think it's important that everybody feels like if i'm a player yeah i don't want to know that the gm is making stuff up they can be making it up it can be scripted it doesn't matter um i just want it all to feel the same i want to feel immersed in the story i don't want to feel like it's just being made up on the fly even if it is mm-hmm. um, so i tried to i try to treat my players the same way um what is your writing process i mean the different stages through through which you go when writing a scenario and how long did it does it usually take you um it takes me what feels like a very long time i have to say <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so if i'm starting a scenario like i've got a Um, write a scenario for the Blasphemous Tome issue 11 for the end of the year, at the end of this year, December 23. Um, I don't, I have a like a, a one sentence idea for what it might be. I, I don't, I'm not somebody with a million ideas for scenarios, so I find it quite difficult coming up with the ideas. So sometimes I just have to take an idea that I don't think is that great and run with it. But I want to make it good. Um, so for one that I wrote last time in the tome, it was uh, it was a um, I decided it'd be a, a, using the Wild West Down Dark Trail setting, and it'd be on board a train, and there'd be a, a hold up, you know, with some robbers robbing the train, and maybe the player characters were the the group robbing the train, or maybe they're on board the train. I hadn't decided that. I just like the. So I'd, I'd sort of start off with a, a concept, an image of, of something, and build from there. It's a process of development, really. Mm. So, and it, it can change radically. So I can start off with that, but then maybe, you know, that one I did stick with the Down Dark Trails cowboy setting. But it might be that it changes to a, a modern day setting. Setting is very elastic to me i'm i'm happy to to totally change the setting sometimes i don't really have any mythos in it and sometimes i end up tying it to the mythos towards the end of the scenario because i think oh you know just to make it fit more like call of cthulhu that was very mm-hmm. much the case for gatsby in the great race um so what matters to you is the plot and then then the the, the setting is secondary comes after the plot is that what you're saying <clears throat> yeah i think what matters to me is um something that's going to grab the player's attention mm-hmm. so that might be a particular mechanic around the table a particular um kind of high concept 
thing like we see in some movies you know like i don't know uh, uh all the names escape from me now the one where they go into to dreams to, to alter things um inception inception yeah so that's that that kind of high concept idea uh and the movie is all built around that so maybe you have that idea and then you know you just sort of see where it goes with a, a scenario um I mean, for Gatsby, the seed of that was just a friend of mine said, wouldn't it be cool if you could have a scenario where you can take a player out of that game and take them into another game? And I just loved that idea so much that I just built this scenario around that that hmm. single kind of concept. Um, so once you, if you stick with the concept, everything else around it can is, is pliable. It can, it can all change. And it can change, you know, towards the end of the, the writing the scenario. Sometimes, like the bad is, I'm like, oh, actually, it'd be better if the players were those guys, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know, so so sometimes I discover who the or I decide who the who the player characters, what roles they're going to take as I'm, you know, working the the scenario up. If I get stuck, I've I've developed a few techniques that that work for me. Um, and maybe this was a part of where I sort of started writing some fiction again, was that I just, I think there's that, that idea of the writer's block, you know, mm -hmm. not knowing where to take it. And I just figured what I'll do, I'll just, I'll just start writing and I'll just write a thousand words about this scenario. And it can be anything. Nobody's going to read this thousand words. So, you know, I can say what I can just express myself however I want and explore a character or you know it's whatever ridiculous ideas come to mind uh, but i just keep writing and once i've hit a thousand words i stop and then the next day i write another thousand and and that was the way i developed full fathom five um because i didn't know what to do with that we had the idea that it was going to be it was going to be a part of an, a, a longer campaign but um it, it didn't end up that way but it was going to be set we wanted it set in around 1850s, middle of the 19th century, and I'm a big fan of Moby Dick. And I said, well, let's, how about I, I'd always wanted to do a kind of Moby Dick type scenario. And I was like, how about we set it aboard a whaling ship? Well, that was all I had. I didn't have a scenario. So then I started doing research on that. And then I, I just hit a wall and I just started writing those thousand words. And I did it about 10 times. And, and after a while, I kind of developed like a an idea for what the scenario could be yeah okay is is documentation also part of of, of your process i mean do you sometimes need to look up a lot of things when you're writing scenarios that for example take place in the past in the 19th century or or in a place that you don't know anything about and is that a part that you enjoy in the in the writing process it's a part of the work that i've come to realize is important mm -hmm. Um, it's not something so I would say you, you were talking about the three of us on the podcast uh, I'd say Matt Sanderson is our man for research okay, um, and yeah he book, book collection he's got a huge book collection as well if I remember yes well. so I think the thing about research that I didn't realize is how much it can feed into the scenarios so um, sometimes in the past I would have written a scenario and then I think if I'm going to publish this, I need to add a bit more realism to it. And I'll then go and do the research to make this location more convincing. And then I discover, oh, well, that's, that's really interesting about this this place at this time. You know, this all oh, this year, this thing happened at this location that I chose. I should have incorporated that in the scenario. You know what? I should have done the research at the start, <laughs> not the end. <laughs> so now I try to incorporate that research earlier on it's not something that i'm particularly uh, invested in doing the research I, t i tend to do it a fairly light touch and it's not something that i include lots of in my work but i just want to give enough i just want to give the keeper enough information that they feel they can present it to their players in a convincing way um i don't think we need reams of, of information to be able to do that because we're not going to spend 10 minutes or or half an hour you know if i'm setting it in 1890s paris 
I'm not going to spend half an hour telling the players what 1890s <laughs> Paris was like, right? Mm-hmm. So we just need a few lines, enough to get, like in a movie, we'd see the Parisian street and maybe it's raining and there are some lamps and there are people going, you know, and you just get that establishing shot and we know where we are. We In our heads, we, we know what the rest of the world is like. And I think we just need enough of that to, to give the players that sense and to give the keeper the the security that they can uh, represent that that location what was the the uh, the idea behind uh, rivers of london why why creating a whole new rpg and not just a campaign using you know um, set in, in in call of Cthulhu? ben aronovich the author of rivers of london when lynn hardy met with him and asked if he would um grant us permission to make a licensed book based on rivers of london he was very keen because he's a fan of brp of basic role playing mm-hmm. um of chaos sims basic role playing game because he's a he's a gamer his history is he's got a big history in gaming when i initially read the books yeah i thought that, so this was before you know any any word of a, a rivers of london role-playing game was was aired i, I read um a, i think the first couple of books and i thought yeah you could do this with call of cthulhu um because it is you know investigative but it is a different feel of game to what one might do with call of cthulhu typically it's less horror there is some horror in it but i think to to draw in that audience and to link in the rivers of london audience and to make it really feel like the rivers of london you know to use all that you know content of the books to have that that licensed property um i think you know it's worthy of its own its own mechanics and its own game yeah your uh, a full phantom five scenario was inspired by a novel you said by by moby dick um Herman Melville and Dogs Hate mm-hmm. Dogs was a little bit inspired by the film of called Reservoir Dogs, of course. Yeah. So, what prompts you uh, to start from a pre-existing film or book, uh, work of fiction, in writing a scenario? Is that because you want to uh, use a common ground with all the players because they've seen the film or they've read the book, so they they have common? I'm not doing it for other people. I'm doing it because you that's for me because <laughs> okay. what i mean is i'm not doing it so so that other people can get into it easily that's a byproduct which is is good i think mm-hmm. um it's, it's mostly for me you know i've seen this uh, if i've fallen in love with a book or a film or a story and that just stimulates my imagination and i think how could i take a bit of that that i enjoy and build it into a game um but i'm not just making a game of moby dick or i'm not making a game of you know reservoir dogs i'm, I'm just taking that as a the the, the a, a feeling of that that i loved and maybe the setting you know well actually yes the setting in both cases um to some degree and yeah kind of exploiting that for my own enjoyment really <laughs> I think some people are afraid to do that. I think they they see somebody else's idea and they think, oh, I mustn't do that because somebody's already done something like it. I never think like that. I always sort of think, well, once I have a confidence that once I've taken, you know, maybe I read, Henri, if, if one of your novels comes into English, <laughs> when is this going to happen? I don't know. You, ha- you have to ask English publishers. <laughs> okay. But I might read one of your books and, you know, fall in love with it and decide to, to write, you know, a scenario based on it. Mm-hmm. But I hope that what I create, because I'm, you know, I go through a whole process, I hope that it would be removed enough from the source material that, it, that somebody might be able to see the link, but it doesn't just feel like a rehash you know a, a reworking of the same stuff so i think it's important that you know when when if you're creative if you take somebody else's idea if you like and then feed it through your own creative process hopefully something new is is being made if you're just making the same thing then you know don't bother there's no point yeah. Um, mm-hmm. yeah and can i say about full fathom five yeah, yeah sure I have got a French translation of it out there i, I worked with a French, French well a French translator um, and she did a uh, 
a version of it. So on drive through, there is, and I hope I'm not going to mess up the pronunciation, Susank Brassi. Yeah, excellent. Right. Susank Brassi, yes. Yes, yes. okay. And, and, you can, and people can find it on drive through RPG? Yeah, so that's available on drive through RPG. Um, yep. Okay, so. excellent. I'll, I'll read it in French, because actually I've read it in English and not in French. I'll tell All you. All right, <laughs> I'll send you a copy if you... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you, you told us that you you discovered role playing game through Dungeons and Dragons, but most of your work now, especially since you've joined Chaosium, revolves around the Call of Cthulhu. Do you still play other role playing games? Uh, and is there one for which you would enjoy writing a scenario, or, or do or do you sometimes write scenarios for other role playing games? Uh, you're right. I mean, I'm pretty much focused on Call of Cthulhu and um, and Rivers of London. I do play other role-playing games, yeah. So I play, I'm in a, a 5e D&D game um, with my friends. Uh, we meet up on a Sunday afternoon and play that. So um, that's, that's fun. I like to keep my hand in with that. And at conventions, yeah, I'm always happy to like play other games. Um, I, you know, I seek out other games at conventions. So I was at Concrete Cow the other week and we played Iron, Iron Swan. Okay. But it was a space version, and it was this uh, the D and D um, spell jammer setting of that. So it was a kind of a, it was a it was a crazy kind of uh, mashup of, of those things. But but yeah, I enjoyed playing those other games because I think you know it's it's important for any well anybody who's working on games to you know to play uh, a wide range of games because people are coming out with with new games all the time. Um, I mean just a mind-boggling number of games that nobody could possibly keep up with yeah. mm -hmm. so you know new ideas are coming out and um you know or slight variations on old ideas perhaps but uh but yeah it's it's uh it's great to to see what's happening and try and keep abreast of it okay so we're approaching the end of the of the episode because i'm trying to stay under the 45 minutes sure. um so my last question is the same uh for everybody you're going Paul, you're going on a one-way trip to a far and distant planet, and you've, mm. you're allowed to bring only three scenarios or campaigns uh, with you, and it's you're not allowed to 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 choose ones that you wrote. Okay? <laughs> Why would I? <laughs> Which one would you take? You know, my memory is terrible. There's a, there's a classic traveler campaign which mm -hmm. lots of people say is really good. Um, and I've got it noted down to read, and I can't remember what it's called. Um, uh, is that the Pirates? Pirates yes, of, uh, Pirates Drenai, of Drenax? Drenax, yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you know yeah, that yeah. Traveller is has never been translated in French, and I'm fighting really? for it. I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, the, the history behind Traveller is crazy, so uh, I can't understand why French publishers have never translated it. Do you, you yeah. enjoy playing Traveller? It's not. It's not so. Uh, it's something I've played a couple of times. It's not because of Traveller that I want to read it. It's because so many people say it's such a great campaign. It's probably the biggest campaign that's ever been published. I mean, it's huge. It's even, is it? It's, it's even bigger than 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 the um, Beyond the Mountains of Madness. I mean, it's. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> <Right>. really big. <laughs> I think it's the um, biggest. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, that's another one. I'll t okay, so uh, am I picking three? Did you say? Yeah, but the, yeah. The good thing about this one is you're going to have a long time to read it on your just. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm getting my money's worth here. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd take Beyond the Mountains of Madness as well because I, uh, that was one of my favourite experiences. I've not run it, but I've played it, and that was one of my favourite experiences of, of playing a campaign. So I'd, I'd like to to take that and, and read it cover to cover. Um, if I were to pick a third one, it'd probably be. I don't know what a third one would be. I don't have a third one in mind. Um, can I just take some blank paper to write something? Oh, that's an excellent, an excellent answer. I love it. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, you, you, you are the only one to have a bonus question before. Oh, you know, I'm honoured. The, okay. That's uh, what Marillion album would you bring? <laughs> I'd take. I'd bring script for a jester's tear. Of course. That's why. Okay. Um, that was where I started with them, and uh, yeah, that's that's always magic for me. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much for being on the show, Paul. It's really an honor for me. I was really happy that to have you as our friend, first English-speaking guest. Send my love to both Scott and Matt. I will do, and it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. Bye-bye, Paul. Bye. Bye.